chapter five of abraham lincoln a history volume eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume eight by john hay and john george nicolay chapter five chattanooga the inference of mr dana that rosecrans was meditating a retreat from chattanooga was modified by a later dispatch which arrived too late to counteract the impression already made on grant's mind it has always been vehemently denied by rosecrans himself he claims that so early as the fourth of october he had laid before general thomas and general garfield his plan of seizing lookout valley and fortifying it covering the road from there to bridgeport and giving himself the practical use and possession of both the road and the river and lookout valley that he was hastening forward the completion of his boats and barges to run from bridgeport to chattanooga that hooker had been directed to concentrate his troops for a move from stevenson and that on the day of his removal he personally reconnoitred the river bank and selected a point for the crossing at brown's ferry to connect hooker with the force at chattanooga general thomas substantially confirms this claim of general rosecrans though he gives especial credit to general w f smith chief engineer of the department for planning and preparing the movement in fact general grant himself virtually substantiates this story on his way to chattanooga he met general rosecrans at stevenson on the night of the twenty first and in the interview which there took place he says rosecrans made some excellent suggestions as to what should be done my only wonder was that he had not carried them out and when he had arrived at chattanooga he said that smith's explanation of the situation and the topography of the country was so plain that he could see it without an inspection still the fact remained that the talk at headquarters was so desponding that taken in connection with rosecrans's own dispatches to washington the government felt that it could not safely leave the command in such reluctant hands at all events grant found on reaching chattanooga the plan for the relief of the straitened garrison already and there was nothing left for him to do but to give the word forward and this was speedily given chattanooga as we have before said was strictly blockaded on the south the lines of the enemy stretched from the tennessee river on the east of chattanooga along missionary ridge across the chattanooga valley to lookout mountain whose beetling precipices almost touched the river on the west of the town at this point the river doubles upon itself in a sudden loop which forms a narrow promontory called moccasin point which was in possession of the union troops but the left side of the river from lookout to bridgeport was occupied by the confederate pickets this was the natural line of supply for rosecrans's army and in relinquishing lookout mountain he had given up the advantage of this short line the loss of which had reduced his army almost to starvation the plan which general smith or rosecrans had devised was to seize brown's ferry on the tennessee at the northern base of moccasin point while hooker crossing at bridgeport should take possession of lookout valley this would relieve the whole extent of road and give to the union army the advantage of river transportation from bridgeport to kelly's ferry from which point there was a good wagon road to brown's ferry and thence to chattanooga thomas had already ordered the concentration of hooker at bridgeport and smith had prepared the pontoons necessary for bridging the river at brown's ferry grant 
by a reconnaissance made immediately on his arrival satisfied himself of the feasibility of the undertaking and immediately gave orders for carrying it out he says in his memoirs general w f smith had been so instrumental in preparing for the move which i was now about to make and so clear in his judgment about the manner of making it that i deemed it but just to him that he should have command of the troops detailed to execute the design although he was then acting as a staff officer and was not in command of troops at three o'clock on the morning of the twenty seventh of october general hazen embarked a force of one thousand eight hundred picked men in sixty pontoons committing themselves to the swift current of the tennessee which obviated the necessity of using oars they silently glided down the rapid river under the works of the confederates almost within touching distance of the muskets of the pickets on the banks and arrived in the early dawn at brown's ferry surprising the picket guard and capturing most of it smith had marched in advance and was on the right side of the river when hazen landed on the left smith's force was rapidly ferried over the pontoon bridge was quickly and skilfully laid and the heights on the left bank were speedily fortified so as to defend the bridge against any force the enemy would be likely to bring against it the distance was so short across moccasin point from chattanooga that the whole union army could reinforce smith's detachment before the confederates could arrive there hooker's part of the enterprise was executed with equal skill and celerity which was the more remarkable as every step of his progress across the river and along lookout valley could be seen from the enemy's watch-towers on the craggy heights of the mountain he crossed the tennessee by the pontoon bridge at bridgeport on the morning of the twenty sixth with the eleventh corps under general howard and a part of the twelfth under general geary and with two companies of tennessee and alabama cavalry he left small detachments as he advanced to guard the route over which he had passed his march was somewhat protected from the enemy on lookout mountain by a range of hills that divided the valley in its centre and although under fire the greater part of the way he suffered small damage and little annoyance at the same time general palmer with a division of the fourteenth corps was ordered to cross the river opposite whitesides and take up a position in support of hooker's line of march he met with some delay but finally got over howard's advance had a slight skirmish with the enemy as they drew near the river but the confederates were easily driven across lookout creek about five o'clock at night the column halted a mile or more up the valley from brown's ferry and although no continuous line had as yet been established the troops at brown's ferry howard's corps and geary's division were cheered by the news which spread from one camp to the other that lookout valley was once more in their possession and the line at bridgeport opened for the relief of their comrades this position of such vast importance that it involved nothing less than the life and death of the army was not to be held without a struggle the progress of hooker's column and the landing of smith's expedition had struck the confederate commander with something like consternation the day before he had imagined he held his enemy firmly in his grasp general bragg had taken as he thought dispositions which ensured the enemy's speedy evacuation of chattanooga for want of food and forage possessed of the shortest route to his depot and the one by which reinforcements must reach him we held him at our mercy and his destruction was only a question of time now in the most unexpected and surprising manner he saw his prey wrenched instantly from his grasp and his own continuance in his present camp depending upon the issue of a desperate battle unless he could at once re-establish his hold on lookout valley 
he attempted by a night attack to seize the ground which had been occupied in open day before his eyes longstreet's corps his most trustworthy troops under the lead of his best general was sent against hooker's force it had been seen before nightfall that a considerable interval had been left between geary's division and howard's corps and it was thought that relying upon the superior knowledge of the country possessed by the confederates the union troops might be thrown into confusion by a surprise in the darkness geary's pickets were driven in but made such resistance that he was in line of battle to receive the direct attack when it was made he defended himself with obstinacy and howard was directed to double quick schurz's division to his relief steinwehr's division followed but both of them on their way to geary were themselves attacked on the left flank and a spirited battle occurred lasting several hours in which the opposing forces could only mark each other's positions by the flash of their muskets the confederate attack was repulsed from one end to the other of the union line hooker's loss was between four hundred and five hundred longstreet's was something more than this as geary reports having buried one hundred and fifty three in front of his lines and one hundred confederate prisoners were taken the enemy made no further attempt to dispute the possession of lookout valley communication was established from brown's ferry to wauhatchie the rebel pickets from lookout to kelly's ferry dispersed or surrendered supply trains began running regularly over the shortened line and the garrison finding itself once more in communication with the source of supplies and of reinforcements took fresh heart and courage and was ready to move against the enemy general bragg under fatal advice now made the greatest error in all his career about the middle of october mr davis had visited him in his camp before chattanooga they had gone together over the battlefield of chickamauga the confederate president had made a series of complimentary and boastful speeches to the soldiers and officers of the army praising them for what they had done and promising them still greater triumphs in the near future it is conjectured that his visit had for its principal object the arranging of some difference of opinion which had arisen between longstreet and bragg and that for the purpose of removing an element of discord from the army he had suggested the detachment of longstreet's corps to capture or destroy the army of burnside at knoxville mr davis had always great confidence in his own military ability and viewed his own plans with a complacency which was not disturbed by their continual failure he was so elated on leaving the camp at chattanooga that discounting the success of the campaign he had planned he bubbled over with satisfaction in the speeches he made on his route at selma alabama on the eighteenth of october urging the citizens to gather their guns and go to war he intimated that such blows would soon be dealt the enemy as he would find it difficult to recover from he spoke of the aid this would give to the gallant men and officers who are carrying out the plans of the noble longstreet under the supervision of the heroic bragg he was confident that rosecrans could be crushed to dust and his defeat would practically end the war he firmly believed that next spring would see the invader driven from our borders longstreet however did not start immediately after the visit of mr davis it was only after the defeat of longstreet in the night battle at wauhatchie that bragg 
being convinced that his grip on the army at chattanooga was loosening determined to seek compensation in an expedition against burnside on the third of november longstreet received his orders to march and the next day he took his departure from tyner's station his orders were to drive burnside out of east tennessee or better to capture or destroy him he took with him hood's and mclaws's divisions and wheeler's cavalry not less than twenty thousand men he remained for several days at sweetwater asking for another division and it was the fifteenth of november before he really took the road grant was promptly informed of the movement and on the seventh of november issued peremptory orders to thomas to make a powerful demonstration on the enemy's right wing on the northern extremity of missionary ridge for the purpose of recalling longstreet he as well as the general-in-chief and president was in great anxiety about burnside and he preferred to have the most formidable corps of the rebel army in his front rather than see the army at knoxville exposed to such serious danger the orders of the seventh of november took thomas by surprise the plan devised by general w f smith to advance the pickets on the left to sitico creek about a mile in front of the position they had been occupying and to threaten the seizure of the northwest extremity of missionary ridge had been under consideration for several days smith's plan was intended partly to occupy the space which would be necessary on sherman's arrival for the proper encampments and probable developments for a battle and the menace to missionary ridge was intended merely as a feint which might possibly induce the recall of longstreet but grant's intense desire to relieve burnside and to effect some practical result against the enemy in front of him led him to change these orders into a peremptory direction to thomas to attack the north end of missionary ridge and from there to threaten and even attack if possible the enemy's line of communication between dalton and cleveland the moment thomas received the order he said to smith that if he attempted to carry it out his army would be terribly beaten and he asked smith to get the order revoked but before any representations were made to grant smith thomas and brannan chief of artillery made a careful reconnaissance of the field from a hill opposite the mouth of chickamauga creek and being convinced that with their starved and skeleton animals they could do nothing with their field artillery and that there were not muskets enough in thomas's command to execute the task proposed they reported that the movement could not be made until the arrival of sherman's column and grant countermanded the order in his official report he simply says that after a thorough reconnaissance of the ground however it was deemed utterly impracticable to make the move until sherman could get up because of the inadequacy of our forces and the condition of the animals then at chattanooga but he never thoroughly forgave general thomas for this difference of opinion and in badeau's life and his own personal memoirs general grant's disapproval of the conduct of his great subordinate is indicated the general judgment of military men however is that in this respect thomas was right and grant was wrong general smith says when it is remembered that eighteen days after this sherman with six perfectly appointed divisions failed to carry this same point of missionary ridge at a time when thomas with four divisions stood threatening bragg's center and hooker with nearly three divisions was driving in bragg's left flank bragg having no more strength than on the seventh it will not be a matter of surprise that the order staggered thomas it will be remembered that general rosecrans also expressed his dissatisfaction at thomas's slowness at the very moment when his 
caution was saving negley and baird from destruction at the hands of bragg at this still more important juncture the cool and imperturbable judgment of this great soldier again rendered invaluable service to the country he firmly confronted the weighty censure of his powerful commander and again like fabius cunctator rendered the state the best possible service by delaying until sherman came and made victory certain the week that elapsed was one of intense anxiety and suspense sherman was making every possible effort to hasten the advance of his column but it is a far cry from vicksburg to chattanooga and every day's march was thickly sown with obstacles low water in the mississippi river and the scarcity of wood and coal made his progress up the river slow and tedious from time to time they landed to gather fence rails by the riverside or to push out into the interior with wagons for wood on the second of october sherman reached memphis and started his troops across country to the rescue of rosecrans he had four hundred miles of marching through a region almost denuded of supplies and infested by large bodies of hostile cavalry at colliersville october eleven he took part in person in the defence of a railroad station against chalmers and a large force of horse and artillery blair who commanded the advance skirmished with the enemy all the way to tuscumbia which he occupied on the twenty seventh of october sherman having now received command of the army of the tennessee assigned blair to the command of the fifteenth army corps and set general dodge with eight thousand men to work repairing the railroads on the twenty seventh sherman received at iuka a message from grant borne by a scout who had floated down the tennessee ordering him to drop all work on the railroads east of bear creek and to put his command in motion towards bridgeport until he met orders sherman hastened to the front leaving blair to bring up the rear and with infinite trouble from bad roads and swollen rivers he arrived at bridgeport on the night of the thirteenth of november and rode into chattanooga on the night of the fifteenth the next day he reconnoitred the field of the coming battle from the same hill where thomas had stood on the seventh and surveyed with a kindling heart the work laid out for him and his army to perform the week before would have been one of intolerable suspense to grant and his army if the time had not been fully occupied by the preparation for the impending struggle all things sherman says had been prearranged with a foresight that elicited my admiration from the hills we looked down on the amphitheatre of chattanooga as on a map and nothing remained but for me to put my troops in the desired position grant's original plan had been to throw sherman's force across the river at a point near the mouth of chickamauga creek from which he should attack and carry the extremity of missionary ridge thomas was so to dispose his troops as to cooperate in this movement and after the ridge was carried the united forces were to rush to the railroad between cleveland and dalton hooker was to attack and carry lookout mountain if possible while a demonstration was to be made on trenton to induce bragg to believe that the movement of rosecrans in september was to be repeated he changed his mind however a few days later having resolved to throw a very large force into the attack on the northwest end of missionary ridge he determined to detach howard's corps from hooker and to hold it in readiness to move to the support of sherman or thomas but even grant the most masterful of all our generals could not absolutely control the course of events and on the very eve of battle he reverted to the former plan 
he had intended that the attack should be made on the twenty first but a furious rainstorm which began on the twentieth and continued for two days made the movement impossible though sherman pushed his troops forward with his habitual fiery zeal they could not get into position on the day fixed the time however was not lost while sherman in spite of flooded roads and bridges repeatedly broken as fast as repaired was bringing his troops into a sheltered position behind the hills north of chattanooga where they were entirely concealed from the view of the enemy thomas brought howard's corps in full view of bragg's observatory on missionary ridge across the river through the town of chattanooga out into the open fields in front of the union works this move was made to induce the enemy to believe that the troops from brown's ferry had been brought to reinforce the union centre while this dramatic display of a splendidly appointed corps from the army of the potomac passed under the watching eyes of the enemy the serious attack upon his right wing was preparing north of the river screened behind the hills of chattanooga and hugh ewing having made his demonstration at trenton had been hurried forward to the extreme left of the national army even on the twenty third the disposition of the troops was not yet completed but grant resolved to postpone his movement no longer he had received a letter from bragg on the twentieth notifying him that prudence would dictate the early withdrawal of non-combatants from chattanooga this ruse was altogether too gross to be taken seriously grant suspected at once that bragg was intending to retire and this suspicion was strengthened on the night of the twenty second by the report of a deserter that confederate troops were already moving to the rear this report although untrue grant afterwards thought was made in good faith and was founded on the fact that bragg had sent reinforcements to longstreet and with incredible fatuity was preparing to send others believing that bragg was about to retire and not willing to allow him the privilege of withdrawing his army intact grant ordered thomas to make such a demonstration in front of his line on the twenty third as to determine whether the enemy was still there in force or not this duty was assigned to general gordon granger commanding the new fourth corps made up principally of the remains of mccook's and crittenden's former commands at the most prominent salient of the union line stood a redoubt called fort wood where twenty-two heavy guns had been placed in position on either side of this fort two divisions of granger's command were formed on the left general wood and on the right general p h sheridan who was this day to fight for the first time under the eyes of grant and to enter on the career of unbroken success which was to bring him to the head of the army during the early part of the day the valley was filled with fog which concealed it from the view of the enemy on the surrounding heights but in the afternoon the veil lifted and the confederates on the ridge saw below them a sight full of scenic beauty two splendid divisions moved out in front of the union line drums beating and colors flying behind them the eleventh corps was drawn up in mass and on granger's right baird and johnson of palmer's fourteenth corps were held under arms in the entrenchments so measured and precise were the movements of the troops that the confederates imagined it was a dress parade going on in the plain and they assisted at the show with no interest except that of pleased spectators but suddenly after the troops had rested some half an hour in line 
the order to advance was given sheridan's and wood's divisions rushed forward upon the rebel pickets driving them rapidly through the low-lying ground and the thin woods reaching the grand guards almost as soon as the pickets themselves capturing bragg's first line of rifle pits and several hundred men and securing themselves in their new position before reinforcements could arrive from the main confederate line the union line was thus pushed forward in the arc of a circle about a mile in front of the position it had held the day before an eminence called orchard knob was seized and hastily fortified and although this success led immediately to no substantial result and indeed it has been criticised as a needless and premature warning to the enemy its moral effect seems to have been an ample compensation it was a brilliant and easy success important in the ground gained for future work and valuable in the cheer and encouragement it gave to the troops who had been beaten at chickamauga and so long shut up in the entrenchments at chattanooga they had met the enemy they had been confronting and had gained the first round of a fight which all felt sure was to be decisive evening closed in with the roar of artillery from every point of the opposing lines which seemed to the excited soldiers to express the exultation of the national troops and the defiance of the confederates it was night on the twenty third before sherman's forces had been brought together opposite the mouth of the chickamauga and even then his rear division under osterhaus had been cut off by the broken bridge at brown's ferry but grant determined to wait no longer he detached osterhaus's division to hooker and ordered sherman to make his attack with the other three assisted by j c davis who had been detached from thomas to support him before midnight his pontoons were loaded they dropped silently down to the point above the mouth of the creek then moving cautiously along the river his troops captured successively all the confederate pickets except one by daylight of the twenty fourth eight thousand men were on the south bank of the tennessee safely established in their rifle trenches as soon as it was light a pontoon bridge was built over the tennessee and another over the creek i have never says sherman beheld any work done so quietly so well and i doubt if the history of war can show a bridge of that extent one thousand three hundred and fifty feet laid so noiselessly as well as in so short a time i attribute it to the genius and intelligence of general w f smith sherman had carefully explained to each of his division commanders the work required of him and shortly after noon he marched from the river in three columns the left commanded by general m l smith on chickamauga creek the centre under general j e smith and the right under general ewing a light rain fell and the valley was shrouded in mist and fog reaching the foothills the skirmishers of sherman kept up the face of the hill followed by their supports a brigade of each division went rapidly to the top of the hill and though energetically opposed by the enemy the point which sherman had selected as the first position to be gained was reached here a grave disappointment awaited him all the maps he had seen were imperfect and represented missionary ridge as one continuous hill from his observatory north of the river the vast wrinkles of the ridge were not seen and now on gaining the top of the hill for which he had so gallantly fought he found that a considerable valley lay between him and the strong position of the enemy over the railroad tunnel which had been his chief objective point he fortified himself strongly however during the night and the blaze of his campfires gave to grant the assurance of a success greater than had really been gained while sherman was attacking on the extreme left of the union line hooker thirteen miles away at wauhatchie was executing with no less gallantry than good fortune the task allotted to him
in the changes of troops which the exigencies at the eve of battle required howard had been taken from him and osterhaus's division from the fifteenth corps and cruft's from the fourth had been added to geary's of the twelfth the only division which remained to him of the army he had brought from virginia those three divisions entirely strange to each other were to participate in an attack upon the formidable position equally unknown to them all of lookout mountain which was held by a strong force of the enemy general bragg in his report says that general stevenson had six brigades at his disposal and upon his urgent appeal another brigade was dispatched in the afternoon to his support hooker had a force not much superior in numbers and utterly inadequate to the attack of such a position as the enemy occupied if it had been properly defended the enemy's pickets formed a continuous line round the right bank of lookout creek with strong reserves in the coves of the hills while his main force was encamped in a hollow halfway up the slope of the mountain the only means of access to the summit was by narrow trails which were defended by strong pickets of the enemy but if hooker could succeed in rounding the northern slope of the mountain he was sure of compelling the evacuation of the place as the only road by which the enemy could connect with their main body was one which zigzagged up the eastern slope viewed from whatever point says hooker lookout mountain with its high palisaded crest and its steep rugged rocky and deeply furrowed slopes presented an imposing barrier to our advance and when to these were added almost interminable well-planned well-constructed defences held by americans the assault became an enterprise worthy the ambition and renown of the troops to whom it was entrusted geary with his own and a part of charles cruft's division crossed the creek near wahatchee early in the morning and moved down the valley his right resting on the rocky palisades capturing the rebel pickets as he moved william gross's brigade advanced resolutely to the bridge and began under a brisk fire to repair it the confederates were at once seen swarming down the mountain from their camps filling their rifle pits and breastworks but they were so much occupied with the men at the bridge that they paid little attention to geary who was moving down in a slight mist that obscured the valley and they also neglected the passage of c r woods's brigade between geary and the bridge at eleven o'clock both these brigades sprang across the river connecting with geary's left which was in position to enfilade the confederate works at the north end of lookout and the whole command rushed solidly up the mountain side driving the confederates rapidly before them the right passed directly under the muzzles of the enemy's guns on the summit climbing over ledges and boulders up hill and down furiously driving the enemy from his camp and from position after position at noon geary's advance rounded the northern point of the mountain they had gained such an impetus that although this was the strongest point of the enemy's position and although it had not been hooker's intention to attack the confederate works at that point without a pause for preparation fired by success the troops pressed impetuously forward with uninterrupted and irresistible progress by two o'clock the clouds which since morning had been hanging over the mountain settled so thickly about the troops that their operations were arrested by the darkness they halted and began strengthening their position while their comrades in the field gazed with intense excitement upon the dense mass of vapour that hid this extraordinary battle from their view occasional flashes of musketry and glimpses of moving lines and of advancing banners were caught through the drifting clouds and proved that all was going well with hooker at four o'clock he sent to grant the welcome intelligence that he had established himself on the northern slope of lookout in a position which he considered impregnable 
direct communication having been opened with chattanooga w p carlin's brigade arrived late in the afternoon after sharp fighting and went to hooker's right relieving geary's exhausted division by this brilliant and picturesque victory the union line was greatly shortened and strengthened and brought into connection so that on the morning of the twenty fifth the enemy having evacuated the mountain in the night the national troops were drawn up in perfect communication from the point where sherman's left rested on chickamauga creek to the lofty summit of lookout mountain where the eighth kentucky had planted the union flag to catch the first rays of the morning sun it was not only the material advantages gained on this epic march which made the battle above the clouds memorable moral benefits of the highest character also came from it when hooker first started west mr lincoln wrote to rosecrans that the relations between hooker and slocum were not such as to promise good in their relative positions he therefore earnestly requested rosecrans to make a transposition by which slocum and his corps might pass from under the command of hooker and hooker in return receive some other equal force rosecrans answered that any attempt to mingle them the troops of his army with potomac troops by placing them under potomac generals would kindle a flame of jealousy and dislike but here without a moment's warning troops from the veteran army of the tennessee had been mingled with troops transferred from the soil of virginia and these joined to soldiers of the army of the cumberland had been put unexpectedly under the command of a potomac general and all had marched like brothers under extraordinary circumstances to battle and to victory showing how incapable were the rank and file of that patriot army of the petty meanness imputed to them by their general it was a happy augury a final success that this lofty watch-tower the possession of which had been so ardently desired for two weary years by the president should at last be permanently occupied by the national power through the fraternal and unselfish valor of soldiers coming from every army and almost every state of the union sherman had been ordered to renew his attack on the left at daybreak on the twenty fifth he obeyed his orders with the utmost gallantry and no lack of skill but not with the success for which grant had hoped and planned it had been his expectation that hooker's demonstration on the left and the threatening attitude of thomas in the centre would have occupied enough of bragg's army to enable sherman to gain missionary ridge with comparative ease and to push the national left between longstreet and bragg but the confederate general perceiving at once in what direction his real danger lay through the bulk of his force against sherman and having obstinately barred his passage on the twenty fourth was prepared on the twenty fifth also to make his principal battle against him though deeply chagrined by the failure of stevenson to hold lookout mountain bragg comprehended the situation on the night of the twenty fourth and ordered withdrawal of his forces from lookout concentrating them all on missionary ridge he relied to a great extent on the strength of his works to defend his left flank and his centre which was under the command of breckinridge with stuart's buckner's and hindman's divisions and threw to the right his heavy columns under claiborne cheatham walker and stevenson the whole under command of hardy the morning broke clear and cold the fog and mist of the previous day had passed away and as sherman who had mounted his horse in the twilight before dawn and had ridden from one end to the other of his line began to marshal his forces for the attack he could see from his commanding position on the left the whole field of battle the most grandiose and picturesque of the war the plain of chattanooga broken by low ridges and small watercourses 
interspersed with clumps of sparsely growing trees and cut throughout its length by the parallel entrenchments of the hostile armies to the north the tortuous stream of the tennessee winding among wooded hills and lofty rocks and still further to the north the bare and rugged heights of walden's ridge and the cumberland mountains on the extreme right the sheer precipices of lookout mountain closed the view and in front the steep slope of missionary ridge crowded with the confederate batteries and fringed by the wavering batter flags of the rebellion barred the passage of the union arms to atlanta and the heart of the south but the first sight that greeted the eyes of sherman was that the hill in front of him was held by the enemy with breastworks of logs and fresh earth and that the high hills beyond swarmed with heavy masses of confederates supporting formidable batteries a great gorge lay between where although sherman could not see them his quick intelligence surmised the presence of the confederate reserves the sun had risen before his preparations were completed and the bugles sounded forward general j m corse led the centre along the ridge m l smith commanded the left as he had done the day before and j m loomis the right supported by two reserve brigades of j e smith general howard had reported to sherman early in the day with the eleventh corps and had been posted on the left baird also who had been feeling chattanooga creek early in the morning was ordered to report to sherman and hurried to the left only to be told that he was not needed and returned to take his place between the point where sherman's battle was going on and the left of t j wood's division which was standing under orders in front of missionary ridge there is but little to be said of the morning's work except that both armies fought with the greatest possible gallantry and determination without seriously damaging either side from early noon until three o'clock sherman was expecting a cooperative movement on the part of thomas and as often as the imperative demands of the work before him gave him an instant of leisure he looked anxiously to his right for the opening of the battle in that direction but an occasional shot he says from fort wood and orchard knob and some musketry fire and artillery over about lookout was all that i could detect on our side but about three p m i noticed the white line of musketry fire in front of orchard knob extending farther and farther right and left and on we could only hear a faint echo of sound but enough was seen to satisfy me that general thomas was at last moving on the centre but night had fallen on his gallant but unavailing struggle before he heard of the exploit of the army of the cumberland which will remain for ever immortal in our annals the short afternoon was rapidly waning grant and his principal generals were waiting upon orchard knob for news of such decisive success from sherman as to justify the co-operating movement on the part of thomas which had been ordered and also for tidings that hooker had descended from the slope of lookout and had made his expected attack on the left flank of the enemy at rossville but sherman as we have seen had met with unexpected obstacles and though the greater part of the union army was under his orders they had not been able to make head against the heavy masses of confederate infantry and the formidable works which he found springing up as if by magic in his path while hooker had also been detained several hours in the passage of chattanooga creek but he had at length got his forces across that stream and was even now by a rapid and skilful movement on each side of the gap driving the enemy from their works the same by the way which rosecrans had thrown up to defend his retreat from chickamauga and was striking the heavy blows which were soon to force the confederate left in upon the centre this however was not yet known to grant and the absence of tidings gave him some anxiety at last concluding that hooker must from the nature of the case have already made his way to rossville he gave orders for thomas's advance baird had by this time got into position on the left of wood and the union line stretched in martial array from left to right in this order baird wood and sheridan each with three brigades and johnson far on the right his two brigades slightly refused 
they had stood there all day like well-bred hounds straining at the leash excited and restless at their apparent inaction while the sound of furious battle coming from the left showed how their comrades were striving at a distance varying from four to nine hundred yards in their front was the first line of the enemy's entrenchments from there the slope of missionary ridge ran up nine hundred yards to the crest bristling with batteries and protected by rifle pits while halfway up this steep ascent was another imperfect line of works their orders were to take the first line of rifle pits there to halt and reform as firmly and steadily as if upon holiday drill this magnificent line of veterans passed through the intervening wood and arriving at the open ground beyond broke into double quick and rushed at full speed upon the confederate entrenchments sheridan who was in advance of his division looked back at this serried line of waving and glittering steel behind him and felt from that moment that nothing could withstand a rush of arms so terrible and imposing the confederates threw themselves flat in their trenches and the union troops rushed over and beyond them a thousand prisoners were sent to the rear crouching before the rain of metal their own batteries were flinging upon both armies from the crest here according to orders the whole force should have halted but a spirit had been raised in that long line of brave men that no order could hold in check the position was in fact untenable the rifle pits they had taken were commanded in every nook and corner by the blazing batteries above to stay there was useless slaughter to give way in the spirit that then animated the troops was impossible one by one without orders the color-bearers rushed to the front and the men followed sheridan and others sent back for orders to take the crest they came in such contradictory shape that a moment's confusion resulted wagner's brigade with superb obedience marched back to the rifle pits and held their places for a little while with terrible loss but the delay lasted only a few minutes in the heat of valorous expectation and a certain prescience of victory that spread over the whole line the orders of the morning passed out of view and the officers from the commanders of corps to the last corporal gave by common consent the word to go forward captain avery came to sheridan from granger with permission to go to the crest if he could do so sheridan asked the aide-de-camp for his flask and raising it towards the crest of the ridge where bragg's headquarters were visible he bowed and drank to his adversary with the frontier salutation how and dashed forward with his men up the precipitous slope of the mountain this continent has never beheld a scene of such grandeur as that which followed the whole army was swept forward by an irresistible impulse in each brigade and regiment little attention was paid to lines of formation the color-bearers sprang forward first a few of the strongest men gathered immediately about them and groups of soldiers which a spectator describes as looking from a distance like inverted v's began climbing the mountain at every point and yet so homogeneous was the spirit of daring and patriotism in every division that taken as a whole the entire mass went up the hill together several times out of breath with the furious rush they dropped panting upon the mountain side for a moment's rest and the enemy at the top of the hill thought they were repulsed but still the blue line went up gaining ground every moment under the frightful fire of grape and canister from the batteries and the incessant hail of musketry from the rifle pits the commanders on orchard knob watched the movement with intense concern when the troops broke away from the enemy's first line of rifle pits grant turned to thomas and said by whose orders is this thomas who knew his soldiers said with his imperturbable smile by their own i fancy but still as the soldiers drew nearer and nearer to the summit the anxiety increased every instant and when at last the blue line reached the last range of rifle pits near the crest general w f smith says that he turned away his face in the intolerable suspense until the cheer that filled the whole valley with its echoes showed that the victory was won the troops poured over the top of the ridge like the crest of a breaking wave without firing a shot they captured a large number of the rebels in the rifle pits 
driving the rest in panic across the narrow plateau seizing the guns and turning their enfiladed fire against their late owners so sudden and so overwhelming was the rush so ineffectual against the spirit of the union soldiers had been the rain of fire and lead as they swept up the mountain side that no impulsive fight seemed to be left in the confederates when they reached the summit the labor of that strenuous climb up a slope of nearly one thousand yards must have exhausted the attacking force so as to render them an easy prey to the fresh troops on the summit if they had shown any enterprise but all accounts agreed that once up they met with no resistance general bragg himself who by some strange hallucination the moment before had imagined the enemy repulsed and who was riding along the crest swinging his hat in triumph and congratulating his troops suddenly heard that wood's men had broken the line behind him and were crowning the ridge thinking this but a local misfortune he sent general bate to repair it and at the same moment he heard that his left had given way at the point where sheridan mounting his short person upon a captured cannon to make himself seen in the confusion was ordering a hot pursuit of the flying enemy hardy on the extreme confederate right still and for some time afterwards held his own with energy as well against sheridan as with the division of baird which after gaining the crest had wheeled to the north and attacked the rebel right but says general bragg himself all to the left was entirely routed and in rapid flight nearly all the artillery having been shamefully abandoned by its infantry support every effort which could be made by myself and staff and by many other mounted officers availed but little a panic which i had never before witnessed seemed to have seized upon officers and men and each seemed to be struggling for his personal safety regardless of his duty or his character meanwhile general hooker was advancing on the left osterhaus took the road to the east of the ridge geary that to the left while cruft pushed along the crest after the first break at the gap little effective resistance was made the three divisions pushed rapidly along driving the huddled confederates before them till reaching the scene of the greater battle they rushed into the arms of r w johnson's division of the fourteenth corps and large numbers were captured seeing the victory won general grant spurred his horse from orchard knob and soon gained the crest intent upon pursuit but even before his arrival the keen eye of sheridan had marked in the valley below a crowd of fugitives with trains and artillery which excited his martial cupidity he ordered wagner and harker to press the rear-guard and capture the trains if possible they marched rapidly forward gathering in many guns and wagons a mile beyond the battlefield the road ran over a high and formidable ridge upon which the enemy made a determined stand with a heavy force of infantry and several batteries sheridan with harker wagner and colonel wood in spite of the fatigue of his soldiers here made another spirited attack the men climbing and clinging to the face of the hill as they had done in the afternoon on missionary ridge holding the enemy in front sheridan sent a part of harker's brigade to the right and he pauses in his report at this point to draw an exquisite picture of a rare and beautiful scene a nocturne in blue and silver but a few moments elapsed ere the twenty sixth ohio and fifteenth indiana carried the crest when the head of the column reached the summit of the hill the moon rose from behind and a medallion view of the column was disclosed as it crossed the moon's disk and attacked the enemy who outflanked on the left and right fled leaving two pieces of artillery and many wagons the enemy abandoned his position near the railroad tunnel in front of sherman about midnight and on the morning of the twenty sixth sherman advanced by way of chickamauga station and thomas's force under hooker and palmer moved out in pursuit on the rossville road in the direction of ringgold at that point they found the enemy's rear guard under claiborne in a strong position well defended by artillery in a narrow gorge and on the slopes of the hill on either side of it 
a spirited action here took place in which hooker's column fought at a great disadvantage on account of his entire lack of artillery when his guns came up however hooker succeeded in dislodging claiborne and continued the pursuit as far as tunnel hill some twenty miles from chattanooga where grant ordered it to cease howard's corps was sent forward to red clay to break up the railroad between dalton and cleveland thus cutting off bragg's communication with longstreet general grant says it was only the imperative necessity of relieving burnside which prevented him from pursuing the retreating enemy as long as he could find supplies in the country but his last advice having been that burnside could probably hold out no longer than the third of december he called back his victorious columns from pursuit and ordered sherman to take granger's corps and with that and his own to proceed immediately to rescue knoxville so great a success was not to be obtained without serious loss only fifty-five minutes elapsed from the time the national soldiers left their positions until they poured over the crest of the ridge but every step of the way cost valuable lives in this charge and in the smaller engagements sheridan lost one thousand three hundred and forty six of whom one hundred and twenty one were officers wood one thousand thirty five of whom seventy two bore commissions johnson on the right had the easiest task though he lost three hundred and four and baird who was favored by the ground in front of him lost five hundred and sixty six including thirty nine officers among whom was the gallant colonel edward h phelps commanding the brigade on the extreme left of the line who fell in the moment of victory after the heights were gained the union loss in the battle of chattanooga aggregated seven hundred and fifty three killed four thousand seven hundred and twenty two wounded and three hundred and forty nine captured or missing a total of five thousand eight hundred and twenty four the enemy's loss in killed and wounded was far less as he fought almost entirely behind entrenchments general bragg in his official report is prevented by his grief and disgust from entering into details he admits a large loss of prisoners and stragglers and of forty guns grant reported the capture of six thousand one hundred and forty two prisoners two hundred and thirty nine of whom were commissioned officers bragg's losses at chattanooga were three hundred and sixty one killed two thousand one hundred and eighty wounded four thousand one hundred and forty six captured or missing in all six thousand six hundred and eighty seven the disparity in numbers engaged was not so great as bragg claims and such as it was he had only himself or mr davis to thank for it grant had about sixty thousand men and bragg some twenty thousand less if the latter had had on missionary ridge the force which longstreet took off on his wild goose chase to knoxville he would have had superior numbers as well as his vast advantage of position grant always thought that the sudden disappearance of sherman's army behind the hills north of chattanooga deluded bragg into the belief that sherman had gone on to the help of burnside and that his feeble and irresolute tactics had their rise in that impression bragg when he made his official report five days after the battle was still suffering an agony of rage and shame he spoke frankly of the panic and the shameful conduct of his troops the position he says was one which ought to have been held by a line of skirmishers against any assaulting column and wherever resistance was made the enemy fled in disorder after suffering heavy loss those who reached the ridge did so in a condition of exhaustion from the great physical exertion in climbing which rendered them powerless and the slightest effort would have destroyed them had all parts of the line been maintained with equal gallantry and persistence no enemy could ever have dislodged us he had but one explanation to give for a disaster and disgrace otherwise inexplicable and that is wholly insufficient he says his troops had for two days confronted the enemy marshalling his immense forces in plain view and exhibiting to their sight such a superiority in numbers as may have intimidated weak minds and untried soldiers but our veterans had so often encountered similar hosts when the strength of position was against us 
and with perfect success that not a doubt crossed my mind there is nothing so potent or so inexplicable as that mysterious essence called the morale of an army the spirit which informed the army of the cumberland on the afternoon of the twenty fifth of november and which rendered it impossible for its generals to hold it back made it irresistible officers and men were swept up the rugged face of the mountain as if by some divine fury of purpose they faced the fiery rain of death as if it had been a summer shower though the fourth corps was twice decimated before it reached the summit general bragg was too severe on his soldiers they did all they could be asked to do they shot one in five of their assailants in that few minutes breathless rush they were beaten and they felt it instinctively they were barely holding their own on their right against sherman's heavy battalions hooker they knew had defeated them on the left and was even now thundering upon their flank and when they saw thomas's splendid army swarming upon them from the plain and apparently caring no more for their deadliest volleys than if they were snowflakes it is no wonder that their hearts failed and that they gave up the fight when the army of the cumberland poured over their trenches end of chapter five chapter six of abraham lincoln a history volume eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume eight by john hay and john george nicolay chapter six burnside in tennessee we have mentioned in other chapters the intense and incessant anxiety with which mr lincoln had endeavored ever since the war began to extend relief to the loyal and suffering population of east tennessee he had lavished orders persuasions and entreaties upon every succeeding general who commanded in that region to take possession of its important strategic points he had repeatedly urged upon congress the construction of roads to render it accessible to our armies every consideration military and political united in urging the immediate and permanent occupation of east tennessee the strategic position was of the utmost importance the great food producing regions of kentucky and tennessee were the source of a great part of the confederate supplies the expeditions of bragg of buckner and of kirby smith into kentucky showed the vast importance the confederates attached to the retention or even the intermittent possession of those rich fields from which they drew their principal supplies of horses of cattle and of grain in the flanks of these mountains also lay the great niter beds upon which the confederates relied in their manufacture of gunpowder their most rapid and useful line of communication between virginia and the west was by the railway which ran through the valley between the great smoky and the cumberland mountains with the union armies once safely in possession of knoxville the rebellion must inevitably perish sooner or later to use mr lincoln's vivid phrase like an animal with a thorn in its vitals but even more strongly than these material advantages did the moral claims of the east tennesseans weigh with the president no section of the country had deserved more at the hands of the republic than those harried and persecuted loyalists throughout the great mountain regions of west virginia western north carolina and east tennessee slavery had from the beginning gained there but a slight foothold and a feeble influence so that the spirit of freedom and patriotism which is so frequently characteristic of mountaineers flourished unimpeded by the noxious influence of a society based upon human bondage 
from the opening of the war this brave and stalwart people had been true to the union as long as they were allowed the privilege of voting they gave overwhelming majorities against secession and after the state had been fraudulently declared out of the union and all its principal towns occupied by rebel troops the loyalists yet stoutly stood by the old flag resisting the exactions of rebel officers to the utmost of their ability and when at last through want of arms and organization their attitude of passive resistance became impossible at home they fled by night in groups of twos and threes at the risk of their lives over the rugged heights and through the laurel thickets of the cumberland mountains running the risk of death by exposure to the shots of rebel pickets to enlist at the first camp of union soldiers which they could find in kentucky many of those who remained at home met with a more dreadful fate than any which soldiers confronted on the field of battle their attitude of silent protest against rebel usurpation was treated as treason they were cast by hundreds into overcrowded and fetid prisons and on the mere suspicion of bridge burning large numbers of them were summarily put to death and according to the brutal order of mr benjamin the rebel secretary of war the bodies of those patriots were left hanging in the vicinity of the burnt bridges the tale of these sufferings came constantly to mr lincoln and there was nothing in the war which caused him sharper pain or excited in him a more ardent desire for redress the loyalists of tennessee were ably represented in washington at first by andrew johnson in the senate and afterwards by horace maynard and others in the house of representatives they considered it their duty to give the government no peace in reference to the sufferings of their fellow citizens and the president striving with all his energies to relieve them found for two years his efforts so unavailing that the sight of an east tennessean at last came to give him the keenest distress when finally he had been enabled to overcome the inertia of rosecrans and had got his army as far as tullahoma on the march to chattanooga and was even then urging burnside in the most peremptory terms to march the army of the ohio into east tennessee to support the movement of rosecrans his impatience and anxiety were such that he declined to meet a delegation of east tennesseans who had come to urge upon the government some action in their favor but he wrote them this letter which shows the painful strain he was enduring the petition of which you were the bearers has just been handed me your cards and notes had come to me on two or three successive days before and i knew then as well as i do now after reading the petition what your mission was i knew it was the same true and painful story which governor johnson mr maynard dr clements and others have been telling me for more than two years i also knew that meeting you could do no good because i have all the while done and shall continue to do the best for you i could and can i do as much for east tennessee as i would or could if my own home and family were in knoxville the difficulties of getting a union army into that region and of keeping it there are so apparent so obvious that none can fail to see them unless it may be those who are driven mad and blind by their sufferings start by whatever route they may their lines of supply are broken before they get half way a small force sufficient to beat the enemy now there would be of no value because the enemy would reinforce to meet them until we should have to give back or accumulate so large a force as to be very difficult to supply and as to ruin us entirely if a great disaster should befall it i know you are too much distressed to be argued with and therefore i do not attempt it at length you know i am not indifferent to your troubles else i should not more than a year and a half ago have made the effort i did to have a railroad built on purpose to relieve you the secretary of war general halleck general burnside and general rosecrans are all engaged now in an effort to relieve your section 
but remember you will probably thwart them if you make this public relief and redress were this time really on the way the dispatch by burnside of the ninth corps to the assistance of grant at vicksburg had for a long time delayed his march to the south but at last without waiting for general park's return burnside started from camp nelson in kentucky on the sixteenth of august buckner with a large force awaited him expecting that he would come by the easiest and most direct way through cumberland gap but burnside chose instead to move by the right directly over the mountains his progress was entirely unopposed he concentrated his forces at crab orchard and on the twenty first of august began his march with general s p carter in the advance he marched through mount vernon loudon and williamsburg where he was detained for a day by torrents of rain on the twenty sixth he passed the state line into tennessee where he was joined by general g l hartsuff's command after two days rest they pushed forward again and in two rapid marches reached montgomery in morgan county tennessee on the first of september burnside with his escort entered kingston on the tennessee river and about the same time his advance took possession of knoxville without resistance the strategic march of rosecrans upon bragg's left flank having by this time caused the recall of buckner to take part in the battle which was preparing on the banks of chickamauga creek burnside's force advancing from kingston to loudon arrived just in time to witness the withdrawal of the rear guard of the enemy and the destruction of the great bridge of the east tennessee and georgia railroad over the holston river following his cavalry advance which arrived on the second he entered knoxville on the fourth of september amid the joyous acclamations of the people who had waited with the sickness of hope deferred for more than two years for the great deliverance he could hardly make his way through the streets for the crowds of delighted citizens of all colors and ages who thronged about him shouting their welcome and cheering the flag general carter who was a native of east tennessee was everywhere stopped and forced to address the people burnside who had no inclination for public speaking was at last compelled to say a few words he acquitted himself of the task with dignity and earnestness saying it had been his fervent wish from the moment he took command of the army of ohio to lead them into tennessee to the deliverance of the loyal people there and he assured them that he had come with means sufficient with their assistance to hold the country permanently and securely when the flag was unfurled from the balcony of the house where he had made his headquarters the crowd rushed forward covering it with kisses and the citizens seizing upon the soldiers and officers without distinction of rank carried them off to their houses to enjoy a warm welcome with what entertainment the disasters of war had still left them it was not at army headquarters alone that the red white and blue standard was seen and honored the flags which had been kept in concealment for so many months were now everywhere thrown to the breeze and the town became radiant with the national colors the immediate duty of burnside was of course to place himself instantly in connection with rosecrans he should have done this even had he had no orders but in reality his orders were of the most stringent character halleck had ordered him to connect with rosecrans on the eleventh of september and as soon as he had become aware of rosecrans's peril in mcclemore's cove he directed him on the thirteenth to move down his infantry as rapidly as possible towards chattanooga to connect with rosecrans and the next day said there are reasons why you should reinforce general rosecrans with all possible dispatch it is believed that the enemy will concentrate to give him battle you must be there to help him 
burnside however seemed unaware of the necessities of the case he had felt on the tenth of september as if the war were virtually over and his work done and he tendered his resignation by telegraph on that day feeling that he could now conscientiously ask to be allowed to resign i look upon east tennessee he said as one of the most loyal sections of the united states the president responded with a thousand thanks but said we cannot allow you to resign until things shall be a little more settled in east tennessee he was then at cumberland gap where he had the day before received the surrender of general j w fraser who with some two thousand troops had lingered too long in that gateway of the mountains and had been taken by an attack of j m shackleford in the rear during the next ten days while bragg was preparing to crush rosecrans's army and the latter was straining every nerve to concentrate his own scattered forces now exposed to such peril burnside notwithstanding all the orders that could be sent to him from washington seemed to feel no obligation resting upon him to make any especial haste for the relief of rosecrans from his own point of view indeed he was losing no time he filled east tennessee with desultory activity and answered every injunction from washington with cheerful acquiescence saying that he would proceed at once to the assistance of rosecrans but he took his own time about it his cavalry was scouring the country in every direction skirmishing as far as bluntsville in the extreme northeastern corner of the state so late as the twenty third the third day after chickamauga he telegraphed the president from carter's station giving a cheerful view of the situation saying he should go to knoxville very soon and though the news from rosecrans was rather discouraging he sincerely hoped and believed he would be able to hold his position he gave particulars of bridges over the holston and intimated that if it had not been for the president's orders he might have accomplished some very important work within forty-eight hours on receipt of this the president sat down in the war department his patience giving way and wrote a stinging dispatch acknowledging receipt of burnside's and saying it makes me doubt whether i am awake or dreaming i have been struggling for ten days first through general halleck and then directly to get you to go to assist general rosecrans in an extremity and you have repeatedly declared you would do it and yet you steadily moved the contrary way he enumerates burnside's dispatches acknowledging receipt of orders and promising to hurry troops to rosecrans adding and now your dispatch of the twenty third comes in from carter's station still farther away from rosecrans still saying you will assist him but giving no account of any progress made towards assisting him the president's chiding continued for some time in this vein but as he wrote his habitual gentleness and moderation of spirit came back to him as frequently happened in such cases and having finished his dispatch he folded and endorsed it not sent but later he sent him a telegram directing him to hold his present position and send rosencrans what he could spare in the quickest and safest way in the meantime he said hold the remainder as nearly in readiness to go to him as you can consistent with the duty it is to perform while it remains east tennessee can be no more than temporarily lost so long as chattanooga is firmly held meanwhile the mere thought that burnside's troops were to be sent to rosencrans drove the loyal tennesseans wild mr maynard wrote from nashville can it be possible that after taking so easy and so complete possession of that country as we have done it is to be abandoned for the sake of a few thousand soldiers more or less numerous than we have ourselves furnished and put into the field remember that chattanooga though politically in tennessee is geographically in georgia and while it is vitally important to hold it it is also vitally important not to abandon east tennessee in behalf of east tennessee we promised you 
first that your army should go in without serious opposition second that the people would receive the troops with welcome third that the country would furnish supplies in abundance for the army all this has been fulfilled and i beg we may no longer be made to suffer by the incredulity of generals-in-chief in the end burnside did not go to chattanooga his favorite ninth corps joined him on the first of october and he established himself firmly in knoxville his position there greatly troubled the confederate authorities and when jefferson davis visited the confederate armies in the west it was resolved to send a formidable expedition to dislodge or destroy burnside it is a singular fact that on the very day of mr davis's visit to bragg when the detachment of longstreet was probably resolved upon the government ceased urging burnside to hurry to chattanooga and president lincoln himself sent a telegram to rosecrans referred to in another place explaining how burnside could not go to him without surrendering east tennessee and making the remarkable prophecy of longstreet's detachment the east tennesseans were however greatly concerned under the apprehension that burnside would be sent away from knoxville and two prominent union men of that place sent on the thirteenth of october this passionate appeal to the president in the name of christianity and humanity in the name of god and liberty for the sake of their wives and children and everything they hold sacred and dear on earth the loyal people of tennessee appeal to you and implore you not to abandon them again to the merciless dominion of the rebels by the withdrawal of the union forces from east tennessee the president answered them on the seventeenth of october saying you do not estimate the holding of east tennessee more highly than i do there is no absolute purpose of withdrawing our forces from it and only a contingent one to withdraw them temporarily for the purpose of not losing the position permanently i am in great hope of not finding it necessary to withdraw them at all particularly if you raise new troops rapidly for us there this work of raising new troops was going on with great rapidity and success considering how many of the more adventurous union men had already crossed the cumberland mountains to join the national army burnside reported to the president that he had already three thousand in three years service and half armed about two thousand five hundred home guards many more recruits could have been had for the three years service but for the want of clothing and camp equipage the difficulty of transportation was in fact the main trouble burnside had to contend with congress had not authorized the building of the road which president lincoln had so earnestly urged upon it and the hauling of supplies from kentucky by the mountain roads was a most difficult and toilsome proceeding burnside's command was from the beginning placed upon half rations of everything but fresh beef and the half ration was afterwards cut in two there were almost no small stores except sugar and coffee but the command was reported by burnside as remarkably happy and willing and ready for any ordinary emergency throughout the month of october the country supplied an abundance of forage although there was some suffering for the want of food and clothing and horseshoes burnside went cheerily ahead surveying the railroad from kingston to the mouth of the big south fork of the cumberland the head of navigation of that river a road was at the same time building from kentucky down to that place to supply the army in winter so much at ease did burnside feel in regard to the position of the army that on the twenty second of october he again tendered his resignation but a situation of the gravest peril was at that moment being prepared for him on the third of november longstreet being summoned to headquarters received the orders detaching him from bragg's army to lead an expedition against burnside he took with him mclaws's and hood's divisions two artillery battalions and wheeler's cavalry he was directed to move as fast as possible and warned that the success of his plan depended upon rapid movements and sudden blows 
driving burnside out of east tennessee was the least of the objects proposed to him it was hoped that he might do better than this capture or destroy him major-general samuel jones was at the same time urged to press burnside from east tennessee longstreet got away promptly next day but in ten days moved no farther than sweetwater with a doubt and indecision singular in his firm and resolute character he repeatedly begged for further reinforcements with a command already double that of his enemy not counting the force which general jones commanded in the northeast he still insisted on another division being sent him he went so far as to say to bragg that he thought he greatly overestimated the enemy's force at and around chattanooga i have seen the force he says every day for the time it has been here and i cannot think it exceeds your force without stevenson's division which he therefore urgently asked for but this demand was very properly refused by bragg and longstreet started with the force he had late in the campaign bragg foolishly yielded and sent him two additional brigades from buckner's force while longstreet was thus making his leisurely march from the southeast jones on the opposite side of knoxville made a spirited dash upon one of burnside's outposts at rogersville capturing the force stationed there burnside on the twelfth of november explaining this mishap said it was impossible to be sufficiently watchful to prevent trouble while so many points were assailable he was then trying to occupy the line from washington on the tennessee river to the watauga and he was holding as far east as bull's gap scouting to greenville and picketing the tennessee river from washington to kingston his main force being stationed along the line from kingston to knoxville his command he said was still in good health and spirits though short of everything by running the flour mills in his possession he could keep five days supply of flour on hand and he had always plenty of beef cattle and salt and though threatened as he said by a considerable force of the enemy on each flank had no serious apprehension of immediate trouble with courage and purpose undisturbed by the undeniable danger surrounding him he said this was certainly not the proper time to evacuate the country and although he heard the report of longstreet's force between sweetwater and loudon he said with almost boyish confidence general grant will take care of this one of the most remarkable incidents of all these campaigns was that while the administration in washington and general grant in chattanooga were filled with the keenest anxiety and alarm with regard to burnside fearing on the one hand that he might be captured or destroyed by a sudden dash of the enemy or that he might lack heart for the defence of the place and retreat to cumberland gap he himself felt no apprehensions as to his fate and had no purpose to desert the post confided to his care whatever may have been his faults and deficiencies as a general a lack of resolution or a distaste for fighting could never be reckoned among them as soon as longstreet's advance arrived at loudon on the tennessee burnside sent a dispatch to grant proposing by gradually retiring from that point to draw longstreet further and further away from chattanooga wisely thinking that in this way he could best assist the plans of grant against bragg grant was greatly relieved by this suggestion not only from the practical assistance it would give himself but also because it was an indication of burnside's confidence in his own power to resist the formidable onslaught of longstreet grant telegraphed him on the fourteenth urging him to hold longstreet in check then to skirmish and fall back avoiding serious loss to himself and that in that case grant would be able to place a force between longstreet and bragg that would inevitably drive the former to the mountain passes and the next day he telegraphed him again a dispatch which is a model of earnest and energetic instruction directing him to hold on to knoxville and that portion of the valley immediately depending upon it 
he said should longstreet move his whole force across the little tennessee river an effort should be made to cut his pontoons on the stream even if it sacrificed half the cavalry of the ohio army i can hardly conceive the necessity of retreating from east tennessee if i did so at all it would be after losing most of the army i will not attempt to lay out a line of retreat i would harass and embarrass progress in every way possible reflecting on the fact that the army of the ohio is not the only army to resist the onward progress of the enemy in this strain he continued for several days his stringent and encouraging dispatches burnside carried out these orders which to do him justice he had himself suggested with great energy and spirit he withdrew from loudon on the morning of the fifteenth and fell back marching in the direction of knoxville longstreet after crossing pushed forward with great energy and tried to reach campbell's station before burnside to cut off the national force from knoxville burnside was however warned in time and by a rapid march reached the station first he had only about five thousand troops and with these he carried on a spirited fight of several hours against double that number of confederates and having checked the enemy long enough to save his trains he renewed his movement on knoxville where he arrived by a night march longstreet following the next day burnside was so little impressed by the strength of longstreet's attack that he telegraphed to the president that he thought there was a chance that longstreet might be simply covering a movement into kentucky but this fancy was rapidly dispelled longstreet at once began to invest knoxville though the investment was never made complete the town had been thoroughly fortified a line of defence extending from the holston river on the left a double line of works fronting west a strong work called fort sanders at the north-west salient and a line which continued from there across the railroad and again to the right as far as the river the south side of the holston was defended also by detached works connected with the town by a pontoon bridge burnside had about twelve thousand effective men which number was swelled by a partially organized force of loyal tennesseans longstreet sat down before the place with over fifteen thousand veteran troops exclusive of his cavalry a number which was afterwards increased to some twenty three thousand his superiority in force was however never sufficient to enable him to invest the place completely burnside still continued to hold partial communication with the country outside and although before the end of the siege the ration was greatly reduced and forage became so scarce that superfluous animals were killed and thrown into the river to get rid of them the garrison was never really driven to extremities loyal farmers floated down all sorts of needed supplies in rafts on the river which were caught by booms at the town and the same device was used to stop the progress of the heavy rafts sent down by the confederates in the hope of breaking the pontoon bridges there was a considerable time during which no news came from burnside at his request general foster had been sent to relieve him but having only a small force with him foster was unable to get farther than cumberland gap and thence he sent from day to day such news as came to him of the progress of the siege which amounted to very little except that his scouts coming in reported heavy firing in the direction of knoxville on the receipt of one of these messages on the night of november twenty third president lincoln who had waited all day with some anxiety for news from knoxville expressed his satisfaction when asked by his secretary what cause of congratulation he could find in a bit of news of so little significance he replied with one of his characteristic apologues a neighbor of mine in menard county named sally ward had a large family of children that she took very little care of 
whenever she heard one of them yelling in some out-of-the-way place she would say thank the lord there's one of my young ones not dead yet so long as there was firing in the direction of knoxville burnside was not captured at last grant made his move upon the enemy hooker fought his way through the clouds on lookout mountain sherman held bragg's right arm as in a vice at the tunnel and thomas's soldiers broke like a thunderbolt through the confederate centre at missionary ridge grant riding in pursuit of the broken enemy spent but one day in this occupation and instantly ordered sherman with his own and howard's corps to march to the rescue of burnside they made all possible haste on the way but swiftly as they marched the news of the confederate disaster on missionary ridge reached longstreet before them he at once determined to wait no longer but to attempt at least to carry knoxville by assault this resolution was taken against the protest of his generals who advised returning to virginia but longstreet argued it is a great mistake in supposing there is any safety for us in going to virginia if general bragg has been defeated for we leave him at the mercy of his victors and with his army destroyed our own had better be also for we must not only be destroyed but disgraced he therefore advanced his line of sharp shooters on the night of the twenty eighth to within rifle range of the national defences and made ready a heavy column to assault fort sanders on the northwest side of burnside's line which was the strongest point of the national works but if taken rendered the capture of the city an easy task the defenders of the place became aware of his purpose by the capture of pickets and made their preparations to resist at dawn on the twenty ninth longstreet began a furious artillery fire to which no reply was made from the fort and after about half an hour the confederate column which had been concentrated during the night charged on the bastion the space in front of the fort had been carefully prepared with abatis and entanglements of wire many of the confederates fell over these obstacles and produced a momentary confusion but the heavy mass behind them pushed resolutely forward and soon gained the ditch and the parapet it was a repetition with exchanged flags of the slaughter of fort wagner the national guns which had remained inexplicably silent up to this moment opened upon the rebels with triple charges of canister the infantry suddenly appeared shooting down the defenceless confederates on the glasses and in the ditch bayonetting or clubbing back with their muskets every head that appeared above the parapet only one of the assailants got over the parapet alive the ditch was filled with the dead and wounded and the glacis was thickly sprinkled with them longstreet lost in this assault a thousand men the casualties on the union side were insignificant burnside reports only thirteen killed and wounded there were only two hundred and twenty men and eleven guns actually engaged in this brilliant defence against four brigades of longstreet lieutenant samuel n benjamin commanding a light battery of the second united states artillery inspired and directed the defence of the fort immediately after the repulse while his broken columns were coming shattered and bleeding back to his lines longstreet received a dispatch from jefferson davis announcing the disaster of chattanooga and directing him to put himself in immediate communication with bragg but learning soon after by means of a dispatch which grant had contrived should fall into his hands that heavy reinforcements were on the way to burnside he saw that it was impossible to form a junction with bragg he therefore recalled his trains which were already in motion for loudon and resolving on the second of december to abandon the siege he put his trains in motion on the third and on the night of the fourth he passed around the north side of knoxville and took up his line of march to the holston 
when sherman was turned back by grant from the pursuit of bragg he imagined that he was only required to protect the right flank of granger during the first stage of his march to knoxville but on arriving at charleston he was surprised to find a dispatch from grant directing him to take command of granger's corps and with whatever force he deemed necessary from his own command to push forward with the utmost haste to burnside's relief seven days before he says we had left our camps on the other side of the tennessee with two days ration without a change of clothing stripped for the fight with but a single blanket or coat per man from myself to the private included he had no provisions except such as could be gathered by the road and was in all respects ill supplied for such a march but without protest or complaint he pushed his column forward with such celerity and to cause the various detachments of the enemy who were guarding the road to fall back in haste without in any case effecting the complete destruction of their stores so that sherman's advancing army lived in great part on the provisions deserted by these confederate detachments at loudon he divided his force into three armies frank p blair jr commanding the right wing granger the centre and howard the left the different commanders were to act independently and on the defence marching to the support of each other at the sound of the guns the bridge at loudon over the holston river having been destroyed the army was compelled to move east on the south side of the river and the principal obstacle in their way was the little tennessee which flows into the holston between loudon and knoxville sherman had hoped to ford this river at morgantown but it was found too deep and the water was freezing with the assistance of general j h wilson a bridge was hastily improvised of cut wood and square trestles made from the houses of morgantown and the fifteenth corps crossed at that point howard who had captured a large number of wagons from the confederates at loudon brought them along with him and made a bridge of them at davis's ford on which he passed his force a new and welcome experience of this march was that the army everywhere received willing assistance from the population general howard says along the entire route we were cheered by the most lively demonstrations of loyalty on the part of the inhabitants a man who had been a major in the rebel service and resigned came to me and without laying any claim to loyalty stated that he had drifted with the current but since our recent victory was satisfied that tennessee would resume her place in the union he gave me information so accurate that i was able to sketch the works at knoxville and the enemy's position he records in another place a touching instance of the loyalty of the tennesseans many of his troops had worn out their shoes in their long march and were tramping barefoot over the frozen ground he saw citizens meeting them sit down on the ground take off their own shoes and give them to the soldiers straining every nerve to reach and rescue their comrades at knoxville whom they considered in such extremity firing their artillery with wasteful liberality whenever a confederate uniform came in sight for the purpose of advertising their advance to burnside all the heads of columns communicated at marysville on the night of the fifth where general sherman met an officer at burnside's staff who announced that longstreet had raised the siege and retreated in the direction of virginia sherman at once wrote to burnside announcing his arrival and saying he could bring twenty five thousand men into knoxville but longstreet having retreated he adds i feel disposed to stop for a stern chase is a long one leaving his own troops and accompanied only by granger's corps he rode into knoxville and was greeted by burnside with the warmest and most courteous welcome but with a serenity which somewhat surprised sherman who had expected to find the garrison at the point of starvation his astonishment was increased on viewing the pens of fat cattle by the riverside and reached its height when he sat down at the hospitable table of burnside a born amphitryon who if he were cast ashore on a coral reef would have asked his shipwrecked comrades to dine with him the next day on whatever the atoll afforded and partook of the best dinner he had had for a year 
the two generals visited together the lines about knoxville passing in review the works which burnside had so gallantly defended and the vastly more extensive and formidable fortifications with which longstreet had attempted to invest the town the officers at knoxville who had expected a much less massive reinforcement looked with some wonder at the three armies which sherman had brought them which they regarded as entirely disproportionate to the service required as one said it was like using the foot of an elephant to crush a gnat burnside at once assured sherman that he required but a small portion of the forces to drive longstreet out of tennessee and with that unselfish generosity which formed the most distinguished trait of his character and which won for him the continual devotion of his friends and the love and appreciation of his fellow-citizens in spite of all errors and mistakes throughout his conspicuous public career he gave sherman a letter thanking him in the heartiest terms for the great assistance his army had rendered to which he unreservedly attributed the raising of the siege and advised him to return at once with all the troops except those commanded by granger to within supporting distance of the force in front of bragg's army there is no reason to doubt that general sherman coincided with this view of burnside it is certain that granger deeply injured himself in the estimation both of sherman and grant by bitterly protesting against it there is nothing to show that at the moment general grant did not himself agree in the wisdom of the course suggested by burnside and pursued by sherman yet later when it was shown to have been a mistake grant in a letter to halleck made haste to exonerate sherman from any share in it it soon became evident that this action was unwise it was either unnecessary to send so great a force to knoxville or having it there it was an error to bring it back without a more energetic pursuit of longstreet than was made grant's orders were imperative that longstreet should be well followed up and in pursuance of them the ninth corps under general park started in pursuit of the retreating confederates on the seventh of december burnside feeling that his work was done now eagerly awaited the arrival of his successor general foster who came on the tenth and on the eleventh assumed command of the department the force under general park was quite insufficient for the work required of him they could neither outmarch nor outfight longstreet's veterans and the result was that without serious molestation longstreet moved to the south side of the holston where in the midst of a rich grain-growing region he passed the winter a sore annoyance to the union people of east tennessee and a constant menace to the union force at knoxville sherman returned with his army to chattanooga and the grand campaign was ended one of the most interesting in its incidents and important in its results that took place during the war of the rebellion it had been since the war began the project nearest and dearest to the heart of the president to establish the national flag in the hill country of tennessee among that loyal and suffering population and to take possession at chattanooga of those rocky fastnesses which once firmly held by the union army formed a salient bastion thrust into the enemy's most vital line of communication completely severing the eastern from the western portion of the confederacy stopping the flow of supplies from the rich food-producing regions of the border to the southern armies and affording a safe and impregnable sally-port from which the armies of the union should march in their own good time on their final mission of liberating conquest on the eleventh of september when rosecrans's strategic march opened the gates of chattanooga the president's first thought was of the political regeneration of east tennessee he wrote to andrew johnson the military governor of that state urging him to seize the moment to inaugurate a loyal state government which should be in the hands of the friends of the union 
a week later he wrote again saying let me urge that you do your utmost to get every man you can black and white under arms at the very earliest moment to guard roads bridges and trains allowing all the better trained soldiers to go forward to rosecrans of course i mean for you to act in cooperation with and not independently of the military authorities but after this letter was written there were still almost three months of battle of march and of siege before this important national conquest was fixed and affirmed and the flag of the union floated in security from cumberland gap to chattanooga and over the loyal hills of knoxville on the seventh of december the president gave utterance to the feeling of reverent gratitude with which the nation hailed this inestimable success in a proclamation in which he said reliable information being received that the insurgent force is retreating from east tennessee under circumstances rendering it probable that the union forces cannot hereafter be dislodged from that important position and esteeming this to be of high national consequence i recommend that all loyal people do on receipt of this information assemble at their places of worship and render special homage and gratitude to almighty god for this great advancement of the national cause and the next day not being of the number of those rulers who reserve all their gratitude for the almighty to the neglect of human instrumentalities he sent a dispatch to grant saying understanding that your lodgment at chattanooga and knoxville is now secure i wish to tender you and all under your command my more than thanks my profoundest gratitude for the skill courage and perseverance with which you and they over so great difficulties have effected that important object god bless you all End of chapter six